right, so we made it out here to the Dolphin Island Sea Lab, and I'm going to meet up with Grant Lockridge. He works here and he lives on the island, and he invited us out for a private tour. So we're about to go meet up with him. He's he's up here at the Estuarium now. We're gonna meet up with him, and he's gonna show us around. And I think we're gonna get to see some really cool, interesting things this time that we didn't get to see last time. So let's go meet up with Grant. All right, guys, so this is Grant Lockridge, and he's the one that works here at the, uh, at the Sea Lab and invited us out, so he's gonna come and give us a tour of the place. Hey, nice to meet y'all. The majority of the animals that are here on display come from a byproduct of the research that's being conducted. Um, so there's four major habitat groups. You've got the Mobile Tensaw Delta, which is to the north of Mobile Bay. Uh, Mobile Bay itself, coastal beach zones or barrier islands and then offshore um, and there's research being conducted at the sea lab at all those different environments and you know if a group's out pulling a trawl a lot of times estuarium personnel will go along and inspect the catch to see if there's any interesting animals and if there are they'll keep them alive put them through an acclimation period and then end up putting them on display here um, so most of the animals that you see are caught as part of the research that's going on here at the sea lab these, these were collected off of an oil rig um, about 60 miles south of Dolphin Island about a year ago. Um, and they're actually an invasive species. I'm not sure when they got introduced. The, um, the, the coral? The coral, yes. yeah, the, the, two, the two corals, the yellow things. Okay. Um, and you see the one down here on the bottom that's got its fingers out a little bit? Oh yeah. So they're filter fingers, so when, when they're getting fed, they'll all stick out and it turns into what looks like a bush or a, or a bunch of flowers. I mean, they're really, really, really pretty. Um, but they're filter feeders. Um, okay. And they like really clear, really salty water. Um, and because of the Mississippi and the Mobile Bay discharge, um, the top half of the water column is fresh water. And so these guys don't, don't start showing up until you get down to about 100 feet. And then right around 100 feet, you turn, run into that really clear, really salty water. And it, it's like somebody, if you look at the, the leg of the oil rig, it looks like somebody drew a line around it. And above it, they don't, they're not there. Below it, they're there. It's really, really, really cool. Okay. Um, but it's just coated, coated the legs of the oil rigs. So you can go out to the rig and actually remove those from the from the rig and bring them in and they survive um yeah um you know you shouldn't do that um unless you kind of are doing it for a purpose you know there's research behind it right or collecting right. it specifically for the estuary or for education reasons. right okay um, but yeah um you can but and it takes a lot of expertise um they are filter feeders so they have to be kind of you know, pipette fed multiple times a week. Oh, okay. So it takes a lot of babying to keep these guys alive, or at least get them transitioned from a wild animal to something that's used to getting fed by humans at, periods, at certain certain times. Okay. Um, it's obsolete now, um, but they still keep it for historical reasons. Um, and you see the legs and the struts going across. Uh, those are Replicate, replicates of what the actual underwater structure of the lighthouse looks like. I think I caught that, um, I didn't have the camera on, but you said this was for the lighthouse? Yeah, so it, it it's it's meant to mimic the structure of the lighthouse. Um, okay. And these are the animals that you would typically see around uh, Middle Bay Lighthouse. And I say okay. see with you know, kind of a, an asterisk next to it because the water is usually so turbid or dirty or yeah. unclear, at that point you actually can't see anything. Um, but these are the animals that you would typically find in that area. Okay. And Grant was pointing out that this guy right here is a snook and not normally found in, uh, I guess, this far north yeah. in the Gulf, right? Right. And a boat captain out there actually, uh, somebody caught that and they kept it and they brought it in here to the facility to, to uh, put in the tanks here. and or move the gravel around. So, right. um, so the eel likes to dig a hole in his little rock area. Um, so you can see the pipes and the estuary and the managers don't like that. And they, so they say, you need to fill that back in. And so and when he's in there, I'm wrestling with him, try, <laughs> trying to push rocks in his hole and he's snapping at me saying, stop that, you know? So it's easier just to yank him out. And so what you probably saw was them training him so that they could get him out easily. And they do that, you know, whenever they feed, 
you know, they put the net in and put his food in the net and he comes up, gets in the net and they pick him up and put him in a cooler, mm -hmm. let him sit there and then put him back in the water just so that when I have to get in the tank or someone has to get in the tank, they, they could very easily get him that. out rather than okay. have to chase him around. Sense. Yeah, they were feeding the fish last time we were here and, and they very easily just kind of scooped the net around them and held them. Mm -hmm. They didn't pull them out of the water, they just kind of held them there. It's probably them training then, him. Okay. Very cool. So I was surprised last time uh, that it's actually scamp in there, correct? Yep. That's the scamp. So yep. I was expecting to see a grouper in there. You, you guys ever put grouper in here? So the scamp is, is a type of grouper. Right. I, I do know that it's a type of grouper. I just know that you uh, sometimes you'll catch a grouper and sometimes you'll catch a scamp. That's the same thing. It is so, the same so thing? So it's like, say, a shark. Right. There's, yeah. there's a great white. There's a black tip. There's. They're all different types of shark. Yeah. Right. Okay. So a scamp is a type of grouper. Okay. Gag is another type of grouper. That's what I remember the uh, captain talking. One. We used to do charter fishing, mm -hmm. and uh, we they call it gag grouper, mm -hmm. and then we catch uh, scamp. Mm -hmm. so, so those are two common species that we have here. Okay. Are gag and scamp. Let's see this guy right here, kind of on his side. This is the triple tail that we were talking about on the other tank. Oh yeah, he's a big, one. a big one. There's another one right up there too. Triple and, tail, a blackfish. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that one's a gag. And so and that one's a scamp. Oh, okay, so the scamp's over there. And it's funny, man. Those guys are just so calm and chill, but they'll freaking like swallow up a whole fish, won't oh, they? Oh yeah, they're <laughs> they're they're top of the line predators. way you tell them apart so if you look at the caudal fin or his tail fin uh -huh. right so see how his is kind of straight up and down yeah okay the other one in the back see how it looks like a c oh yeah he's way back there well, but yeah right. okay so that that c shape right so you got the long ribbons on the top of the yes. bottom the scam that's a scam yep straight okay. up and down gag okay right so that, that's that's the way i tell them apart you know as a non-fish expert with some good info but that's how you can quickly underwater. Eels down there in his yeah, little cave. There's his cave that he digs out <laughs> that he excavates. And so you see like these pipes are exposed. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things we might get in there. We'll be fixing that later. So I really, <laughs> I really love the redfish, yeah. the red drum. Those are some excellent fish to catch. Yes, they are. Man, I've gone out and, and I've had the pleasure to catch those. They're, they're, they're very fertile in our area. I mean, they're everywhere. You can go out and catch them. And unfortunately, they have a slot size, so you can't keep a lot of them. They're either too small or too big. Mm -hmm. That one looks like a keeper right there. You would but, be close uh, to the top end of the slot. Yeah, you right. Would be right on that line. Right, but they're excellent fish, and they fight hard. Yeah. But I've never caught one of those. You said those are triple tails. Triple tail. I've those never. Fantastic eating, like better than like like orders of magnitude better than everything else wow. people, i'm gonna i'm gonna have eat. to try that since you when people eat triple tail i mean their eyes just go big it's like <laughs> oh my we're god gonna, this is so, so that's that's this guy right here a triple tail but we love catching those scamp and those groupers too man those things are it's like pulling up a log mm -hmm. those things just sit there man they don't want to come up and then we got our red snapper there's a yep. there's a red snapper there and I kind of wish y'all had a big giant red snapper up in this tank, man. They get big. They get bigger than anything else that's in here. Um, bigger than the group that you see. Mm -hmm. so the season yeah, was very short. This was three it was, days. The federal season was three days this year. Which, yeah, it's which insane. Was politically, you know, everybody had a problem with it. There's a big. Mm -hmm. beyond, it, beyond our control. There's a small lionfish there. So this is kind of like what you'd see on a on an oil rig leg. Yep. Kind of life cycle. Um, they only live about a year and a half. Um, the octopus. The octopus. And you know they, they. I found them offshore in I want to say communities, but I think they're pretty solitary, like they're territorial in a small area. They don't like to interact with each other. Um, the male and female run into each other. So yeah. Tiffany, he's gonna feed? Yes. You're gonna feed the octopus. Feeding some hearing chunks. See him coming out. Oh yeah, there he is. Oh he's a lot bigger than I thought.
pretty cool, man. So is he eating it right now, yep. that, that chunk yep. of food? Yeah, so pulled it into his beak, which is in the middle of his legs. Right, and okay. He's munching on it now. And he's up at the top, he's looking for more. Okay. They're really, really intelligent. They're, they're about as intelligent as a dog. Okay. So really, really intelligent. Te teach them tricks to recognize people. Uh, I've had some of the ones that I've caught are aggressive towards me when I come up and stand in front of it because I was the one that caught them offshore. Oh, yeah. So they're, they're, they're aggressive. Um, really, really smart animals. But they, um, so they only live about a year and a half. And the male and the female, you know, they don't, they don't have sex like a normal, to like two normal opposing sex would have, but they'll actually do this here. That's so cool. I guess you'll find the other yeah, pieces yeah, down there. Yeah, they'll, they'll start going exploring. But the male just gives the female a sperm packet, hmm. and she keeps that sperm packet for six months at a time, you know, for a long period of time. And when she's ready, she will fertilize her eggs um, and then then lay them inside of her hole. And when that happens, she will no longer eat and she will no longer leave her hole. Right. So at that, when she decides to fertilize and lay her eggs, then she's the that's that's, that's, the that's the end of that's the end of her life. Okay. That's, that, and that's just the normal life cycle. And so a lot of the octopus that we have on display will you know curl up in their hole and not come out. They'll go in there and look and throw a bunch of eggs and they're like, well. That's the end of that one. So you, after that, you have about two weeks before the eggs all hatch. Okay. And they've never had any success, not just us, but anywhere has never had success at um, growing them in aquarium settings. You have to have them in natural Why water. do you think that is? I think they're just really sensitive plankton when they when they're first when they first hatch out, and we just can't we can't mimic the stability of the offshore conditions that they need. They are very sensitive anyway. So I have to go out, so two or three times a year, I usually have to go out and make special trips just to collect octopus for the estuary. It's, it's a lot of fun. There's some, I got some good videos of doing it. You can like go, you can go in, you can go in, you can go, in, you can go, go in there and play with them. And let them play. This is where we keep the animals that are um, acclimating. So when you first catch them, um, you, know, you can't just throw them straight into the tank. You gotta get them adjusted, make sure they're not sick, make sure they're not contagious and or backup animals, so like an extra octopus typically, there's not one now, but this is the kind of stuff that you should keep in, keep in there. Um, there's some really interesting stuff as you walk around. Okay. You said the building used to belong to the Air Force? Yeah, so the whole, the, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab used to be an Air Force base, an Air Force radar detecting base. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and this building that we're in was their radar dome, um, which is now repurposed for animal husbandry. Okay. Some bass and broom in here. There's one in there, but I'm not sure. Looks like another eel, huh? Yeah, I think it's a snowflake moray. I'm not sure. Then this flounder? Yep, there's a flounder. Flounders are good eating fish. Very good eating fish. See the eel over here? Very, very, very venomous. With a very painful to get stuck on. Scorpion fish? Scorpion fish. And they blend in. If they're in, in their normal environment, they blend in, but you cannot see them. It's the same thing as their, as their spines. Super sharp, and you not pay attention, you put your hand on them, and okay. it'll be in the world of hurt for a while. <laughs> we'll stay away from those guys. Well, I found the workshop. <laughs> the wet lab, um, it's where we, we actually do research. Um, okay. So there'll be a whole bunch of like identical set up tanks, um, different animals and different combinations of animals and structure and you know, whatever else the scientists want. Okay. However they want to manipulate. So these in here are all baby red drums. Little juvenile red drums. 
I'm not entirely sure what what they're doing with them. They do really weird things sometimes. So we got a shark in here? Yeah, there's a little juvenile bull shark in here. Uh, there was. So what they were doing, which is really cool, is they were exposing the bull sharks to water from a certain part of the bay. So the northern bay, or over, off, over from Perdita, or in the middle of the bay. And the different elements that it or different minerals and elements that are in the water from a certain area lay down as the animal grows in its skeleton right so these are cartilaginous so in the cartilage structure of its bones and you can go in and look for that structure and so they're trying to identify features in the growth plates of these animals that relate to the environment where they're existing at and that's that was what that's what they were trying to do with these guys um, not that's the Coast Guard station there, huh? Yep. I think this is a training station. Uh, most of, of you were to call in an emergency or need Coast Guard assistance, they actually come from the station up in Mobile. Um, they don't deploy from here, typically. So Grant's gonna take us around here and he says we're gonna check out the boats that they use to uh, go out and uh, help do their research and collect the fish and the different species but once you get them if you've got one that's over a year old you're only going to have it for a month on display depending on where the aquarium is so you know if it's like the atlanta aquarium right. they can't just hop on a boat and go catch another one because they're landlocked right whereas we can so we can a lot of aquariums that are near the ocean RV Alabama. Um, it's our floating classroom. Uh, it's great for that. It's great for that use. So, uh, easy that we'll go inside and look at inside. But it's laid out perfectly for having 15, 20, 25 undergraduate, high school, middle school kids on here and an instructor. And they'll take it out and they'll do you know, trawl nets, they'll do long line fishing. Um, some of the goods you have on here is for, you know, more oceanography related, so it's like physical sampling. Fantastic, fantastic floating classroom. That's what we use it for. So that that winch is actually what got me started watching your channel. Oh, really? That winch right there. <laughs> so, All right. So you you must have been doing some uh, building or repair or, or what? You so had to my, do some machine work. I, I, I was converting it from just a normal 12 volt load bearing winch into a data winch, um, and so it that cable that's on it's actually got a copper conductor inside of it that i can communicate with the instruments okay through it to a computer inside so i can see what the instrument's actually doing i can see what salinity it is what temperature what depth it's at inside right and to do that so if i'm paying the winch out and railing it in and i have a plug that i plug into it right that plug will sit there and spin and you can't have that so you gotta have something called a slip ring that's what this is. That's what this, this unit is. Okay. And so that's what I had to add on to it. I had to add on this slip ring onto the winch. And so the cable goes into the main shaft, this stainless shaft. Yeah. And then I had to drill a hole in that shaft that long right down the center, run that wire out, and then connect it into my slip ring so that I can communicate to it. And that slip ring allows it, yeah. that, that cable to spin. Yeah. And communicate through that was so you were trying to figure out how to drill a hole i was trying to figure out how to drill a foot long hole in a piece of stainless steel shaft nothing to it then uh, yeah, well, nothing to it i broke a couple <laughs> drill bits so oh like, man there's a better way to do this you didn't you didn't go to harbor freight and get a drill bit did you no i just okay. really had on the shelf in there so, all right that was, that was i was trying to figure out there was a, a magic trick to drilling that hole grant grant told me that's actually how he found my channel was he was trying to do some machine work on you know for some of the parts out here for the research and and that's how he found my channel 
and he's been learning different aspects of machining through watching my channel and that's how he found out that I came out here to the sea lab <laughs> so he did say he had a couple questions for me while we were out here this is a data cable so I can communicate through this cable with this instrument and I can you know not only communicate but actually send it commands so every one of these cylinders right is actually what we call a Niskin bottle and so you open these up you open all these up um, by hooking them on these little clips right here um, and then you lower this down into the water and at different depths I can send a signal to it and it trips this clip bottle closes and it takes a sample of water from that depth and so I can do that from a whole bunch of different depths um, I've also got this guy here on the bottom it's called a CTD um, and it measures the temperature the salinity the depth the oxygen the pH uh, the transmissometer so the, the clarity of the water a whole bunch of different parameters that it's measuring at 8 Hertz so eight times a second and I'm getting that on the computer inside the whole time. And whenever I see something I like, I can take a couple water samples. That's fantastic. So that's, that's, this is called a rosette. Really, really, really cool. Very cool. And you drop it off the back of the boat, and it just buries itself in the mud. And then when you pick it up, those jaws close. And it takes the sample of mud, and you bring it up, and then we'll take sub cores from it. But it, it deposits a 0.1 meter cube, one meter cube of sediment on the top on the deck. It's really, really cool. It's an official way of going But this is, this is where all of our dive equipment lives. Um, we're an AAUS organization, so AAUS is American Academy of Underwater Sciences, and that's a group of institutions that do science while diving, grouped together and made a set of OSHA approved standards, so we have to do things, you know, you have to keep this kind of paperwork, you have to log your dives a certain way, follow all these rules, so that we're all kind of on the same level. So if somebody, something was to happen, legally, we could bond together and be protected, because there's actually no legal precedent for a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So it's all great, you know, you can read the OSHA standards and say, okay, that's, that's great, but how do you interpret that? Um, so what is underwater science and how is that different from commercial diving underwater? And that's what we're trying to distinguish between these. Figure out the difference. But like, then you go offshore and the things that you see are untouched by divers, which is really just, so pristine, right. a lot of pristine habitat out there. Whereas like in the Keys, you go there and coral reef is, you know, it's a bleached reef and people are standing on the coral and all that kind of stuff. Which makes them want to cry. Right, but here, if you don't run into that, you run into a lot of really nice stuff. My building crap space. Here. <laughs> oh, that's your workshop. Yeah. Look, it's uh, it's nice and clean. Yeah. <laughs> well organized. Well, I don't know about all that, but um, and then back there is all the. Is where my lathe is. Oh, we're gonna get to see the shop. This this is neat right here. This is a is a blueprint file. Yeah. For yeah. uh. So we actually it used to be for charts for nautical charts is what they used. To be. Okay. Yeah. Same, charts. Same yeah. Concept. Yeah. We repurposed it to, you know. Um, one map. thing that I learned is they're not maps, they're charts. Yeah, I call on the water. I, yeah. I remember calling a, a chart a map one time and somebody corrected me and said <laughs> they're charts. And then another guy on the, the, the videos that watches, he's probably going to get a chuckle, but I had another guy that says you don't have ropes on a boat, you have wow. lines. <laughs> yep. that, that, one, that one is very cool. So they were having fun, you know, talking about that on the on the last video there. Well, I'll check out your little workshop. You know, this is more like my my domain, even yeah. though this really isn't. This is uh, you have a lot of a lot of things, but it's well organized, and and I appreciate that. That's something that I that I continue to work on. You know, even something like that, just a simple holder for all your your Dewalt drills. Wow, um, I really want to do it, and I have it. So this is from a place called the Cooper River in South Carolina. Um, I grew up in South Carolina, I'm from South Carolina. I've been diving this river for a long time. Um, that's one weekend's worth of teeth. Um, that's incredible. So that I, it is a very challenging dive and it requires a kind of a special mental place. You can't see anything, there's oh, really high idea. current. Yep, um, great big alligators everywhere. Um, so it, 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 it's very, very creepy down there. But if you can 
get to that place where it's okay, the reward is, is wow. pretty amazing. Um, lots of really good fossils, lots of really good historical artifacts, lots of Civil War wow. history in that area. Where did you say that is? The Cooper River. Um, it's just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. And Grant was just, Abby had asked Grant what his favorite dive is, and he was answering, and, and he showed us this. So these are fossils that you collected mm -hmm. during that dive. Yep. Very cool. Check so we're stuff. we're coming into the workshop. We got some grizzly industrial machinery in here, and there's the lathe. The G zero six zero two. I believe one of my one of my viewers, James. I believe that's one of the lathes that he had, but before the one that he's got now. It does very good for what I need it to. If, uh, I mean. Well, that's pretty neat. So this is all equipment that is purchased by the the lab mm -hmm. itself, the C lab. So this was actually purchased by one of our PIs, our um, principal investigators, one of the researchers. Okay. Um, you know, she she kept asking us to make things for her, and you know, she was like, "Well, I'll, you know, I'll I'll pay for all the equipment. I'll pay for everything." And it was like, "Well, you know, we need." A lathe. I mean, that's ultimately what it comes down to. So, like, yeah. how much does a lathe cost? It's like, I don't know, 1500 bucks, something like that, for a cheapie. And she's like, just do it. And so, that was the first one that I came across, and that was the one I got. Okay. Um, and she's actually been so happy with what we produced for her that she's going to buy us a uh, Bridgeport mill. Oh, great. A full size. You know, You'll love having that. 45K full size mm -hmm. Bridgeport mill, which I'm really excited about. So here's one of the little projects that Grant was just showing, showing me, and something that he's trying to develop, and he's getting my opinions on it. And I thought I would shoot a little clip here to see if anybody else might have some ideas too, because we're just kind of kicking around some ideas. But uh, without trying to go into too much detail of what exactly it is and what what he's doing with it, is to come up with some kind of little piece like these. These are two that he has been working on and the idea is to have some kind of membrane uh, he used the idea of a condom that is actually attached in here and it is this is put down into sediment or i don't know if it'd be sand or it's mud more muddy but yeah just mu sediment. muddy it's sediment mud. and then they do a pressure tech a, a, a pressure test with it they use some kind of little pneumatic system that's hooked to it and they apply a pressure to it and they actually measure the pressure of the sediment around it. The problem is it needs to be very thin. So this is something he was working on. He was trying to sand it down. But uh, maybe a two-piece deal where you can screw them together that's sealed and have some kind of membrane in the center that's going to expand out as you apply pressure to it. How do you actually get the pressure to that though? Well, so on this one, Scott, are you using the tap hole? Yeah, tap hole. Oh, I didn't see that in there the before. And okay. That screws on to you know, so, a threaded. Okay, so you got that threaded rod with a hole through it. Okay, so that's what's applying your yeah. your air pressure there. So, okay. So that so, will have to be thick enough too. Yeah, but it could even be a possibly one section of the disc that's a little bit thicker to right. to accept the rod to be attached to it like that but have, have it very thin where it's not taking up much area and then have a membrane that can expand out like a balloon to a pressure test. So if you got any unique ideas, drop us a comment, let us know. So this is another one of your research labs here. This is one of your research labs? This, so this, this is Dr. Kelly Doherty's lab. Oh, okay. Uh, so she is the sediment ecologist. Really, really, really smart, doing lots of really cool things. Does that look familiar? Oh yeah, that's like the uh, yeah. So that's the little part that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. See, it didn't quite work very well. You can be rough with it; it's broken. Okay. So there's the idea behind it, right there. And he did he did mention that that shape does make a difference because of the research that's already been done to to prove that 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 shape going straight down into the sediment works for the research that they need um, oh 3d printer yeah 3d printer you see wow oysters so oh, yeah. they, they 3d scanned oysters and then 3d printed them um, and i think they're doing so they're putting this in with a bunch of different animals and seeing if 
it'll if, if the material has any impact on the way the animals use the actual structure of the oyster. Oh yeah. I think that's what they're doing. Um, there might be some other that's super cool. other reasons. All right, guys, that's the end of our tour here at the Sea Lab. And I just wanted to give a thanks to Grant for inviting us out here and showing us, a, you know, a more inside perspective of what goes on out here. All of the research that these guys do, it was it was just very, very great to see this. I just want to oh, thank you. My pleasure, For man. bringing thank us you. out here. It was, it was really fun. And uh, just thank you so much for showing us this. Not not just us, but the viewers too. More than happy, man. Thank, yeah. Thanks for everything you do. I learned a lot from your channel. And, you know, but, I felt like this was a good way to potentially get back to you. So thank you. All right. Well, cool. Well, I hope you continue watching and uh, learning a little bit about the machine work. And we're going to really enjoy what we've, what we've seen out here, man. And I'm sure we'll be back. Awesome. All right. So we finished our little tour down there at the at the Sea Lab, and Grant was telling us about this little place called uh, Island Pizza. What was it called? Island Rainbow. Island Rainbow. So they do they do pizza, and they've also got ice cream and all kind of little sweets, like uh, amazing snow cones, sh uh, <laughs> snow cones and, and ice cream, and they do pizza as well. So we're having us some uh, late afternoon lunch, and what do you think about the the tour today? It was Over. amazing. Have you got anything that you would like to say about the tour? I thought he was a really wonderful guide. I thought he gave a lot of information. I thought he was incredibly knowledgeable. He wasn't even, he's claimed that he wasn't a fish expert, but I think he is. He's pretty knowledgeable with the very, fish. Very, very. And he knows what's going on around there too. He knows what's going on. I think he said that it uh, employs a, a 150 people. Yeah. So it gives a lot of jobs. I mean, I'm a huge fan of, you know, conservation for the ocean and all those things so they do mm -hmm. wonderful 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 work for that so yeah I'm a fan of it I think the place is amazing and I think you should definitely visit yeah. if you get a chance and one of the things that one of the other ladies had mentioned I forget what her name was was that there it's not just a place to go and see a few fish I mean they they actually their their research actually mean something that they're doing there right. they, so. they have lots of classes for children from I think they said kindergarten all the way through mm -hmm. college age kids and I know he said they're getting ready to take a vessel out tomorrow yeah. um, for an oceanography class right and, which right. I wish I was taking <laughs> oh yeah I bet. and um and yeah I mean I, I think they do wonderful work so I hope mm -hmm. they just yeah. continue to you know do the great work they're doing and it's a beautiful thing yeah, it was. It is oh, great. Oh, and I want to go scuba dive right now. I, I know you yeah. do. Yeah. The, the seeing the scuba dive tanks. Yeah. You were ready to get going. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> well, I sure enjoyed my my time there too. Yeah. So thanks for coming along. Thanks for inviting right. me. Uh, you'll be awesome. along. You'll be with all of them. Where's the, Where's our next place? I don't know yet. We'll, <laughs> but we'll go something soon. Okay. Awesome.